what he's done in terms of just popularity. Uh, there was a, uh, we did a poll here. If you look at his popularity, uh, uh, you know, sort of do you have a favorable or unfavorable impression of him, and this is among Catholics, 92% of Catholics favorable opinion compared to Pope Benedict, it was 76%. Pope John Paul, about 87%. And then, uh, if you just look at the impressions of the Catholic Church more generally, this is also among Catholics, in December of this year it's 95%, up from 86% uh, in February 2013, and up from uh, in December 2002 it was 69%. Uh, so he's done something for the church, he's done something for sort of the papacy. How does it feel in the pews, Sister Simone? Well, quite frankly, there's great joy in the pews. He, he just issued uh, what he called an exhortation about joy in the gospel. And I think that is the experience of so many Catholics. One, that we've returned to the gospel message and the less punitive, rigid, rule-oriented approach and rather to the message of Jesus, which is to embrace those who are at the margins and stand together in community. It is, it's a wonderful, refreshing change. And John, I wonder if you could talk about how he's managed to achieve this popularity. I mean, on the one hand, it's this amazing PR uh, campaign that he's embarked on uh, since February of this year. Well, look, me. I think part of it is he had the great fortune of not coming onto the public stage with a pre-existing narrative. You know, his predecessor, Benedict XVI, came with a narrative. I mean, he was elected amid these images that he was the kind of, you know, the Rottweiler Pope, the, the German Shepherd and, and, and all of that, you know, the, the great enforcer for the Catholic Church and over eight difficult years never really shook it. Whereas Cardinal Jorge Mario Bergoglio of Buenos Aires did not step in uh, with any of that baggage. He was able to shape his own narrative, and he did it brilliantly from those first moments on the evening of March 13th when he stepped out onto the balcony overlooking uh, St. Peter's Square. You know, within a few hours, I mean, the, the, the image was shaped. If this was the people's pope, the pope of the poor. Uh, you know, the first pope in the history of the church to take the name Francis, uh, which I think sort of captured the world's imagination. And then over the next few days, you know, we saw a man who got on the bus with the other cardinals rather than taking the chauffeur-driven papal limousine, uh, the pope who spurned the papal apartment and decided to remain in a, in a modest Vatican residence. The, you know, a, a pope who picked up the phone to call his shoemaker back in Buenos Aires and say, I'm not going to be coming back to pick up my brown shoes. Can you please put them in a box and ship them <laughs> over here? I mean, listen, I, I think all of that created a, a, a an image uh, in the world. Of th this is a pope who is an ordinary guy who cares about ordinary people who knows what my life is all about uh, and he has done nothing over the last nine months other than build on that image and sister Simone if you look at I think there's some debate about whether or not there actually is a, a sort of Francis effect in the pews uh, in terms of higher church attendance it looks like it looks like globally there might be but if you look at the Francis effect for Catholics here the percentage of US adults who are identifying as Catholic uh, is 23 percent in 2007 it's 22 percent now uh, that's sort of negligible certainly no effect necessarily uh, there and then if you look at self-reported mass attendance among Catholics, 2007 it was 41 percent, uh, 2013 it's 39 percent. So maybe not necessarily translating into more folks in those pews, even though you say the folks who are in those pews are mighty uh, joyous. Uh, well, there's definitely a change in attitude, but it also reflects the fact that that we've had these years of the Benedict reality and then of Pope John Paul II who was ailing those last years. And so uh, we, we've been without this kind of charismatic leadership for a very long time. And also, so our leadership within the church at the parish level needs some rejuvenation too. And that is a big sea change that takes time. I think more importantly though, it's the response of people to the needs in society that is different. Mass attendance is one measure for where you get nourished, but people involved in society, caring for the poor, that's where there's change. And one of the things that you've seen uh, from this Pope is he's very much a pop culture figure, and, and because of that, he uh, is you know the subject of late night comedians. We're gonna take a look at Jon Stewart's reading of this Pope. <laughs> Let me get this straight. Gays are cool, priests can get married, and you don't even have to believe in God to get to heaven. <laughs> what exactly of Catholicism is left? I mean, you take away Jesus and celibacy, Catholic Church is just an ornate restaurant that only serves wafers. I mean, it's... <laughs> 
his argument there, John, that uh, this is a pope uh, who might be the time person of the year, but he's taking the Catholicism uh, or the Catholicness, I guess, out of uh, Catholicism. Well, I think John Stewart is actually doing a comedy sketch rather than a serious theological analysis. I mean, the, listen, the, the truth of it is that the, the Francis Revolution is much more a revolution in tone than it is in substance. I mean, if, if you look at the hot button issues that most people would prominently associate with the Catholic Church, I mean, things like women priests, gay marriage, abortion, contraception, you know, Francis repeatedly has made it clear that he's not about to sort of toss all that stuff out at, at the substantive level. Right. So that I think rather than kind of turning the church on its ear in terms of its doctrine, what he's done is he's projected a much more human, tolerant, and compassionate approach to those questions. I mean, look, I would just put it this way, that the real Francis revolution is this. As of March 12th, and I'm speaking now as a media professional, as of March 12th, the dominant narratives in the world about the Catholic Church were uh, child sex abuse scandals and Vatican meltdowns right. and crackdowns on nuns. I mean, a sister, certainly Sister Simone knows all about that. Okay. And, and while none of those things have gone away, the dominant narrative today is rock star pope takes the world by storm. I mean, if that's not a revolution, I'm not sure we've ever seen one. Uh, Sister Simone, st women still second-class citizens, though, right, With, under this uh, pope, and I don't know if he's still cracking down on nuns. Well, the the investigation or the overseeing of the nuns continues. Mm -hmm. There's been no change there. Right. He said, keep doing it. He's working on changing the curial structure, the governmental structure. Uh, I, I think, though, that what has changed is this balance because John rightly points out what we are, Catholics are most noted for, these hot button, what have become cultural issues. Right. And what Pope Francis has done is rebalance that conversation to say, yes, that's true, that's important, but we also need to lift up Catholic social teaching, which is all about participation, the dignity of the individual, caring for the poor, economic right. analysis, which yeah. is huge yeah. on the creation of poverty. And he, of course, came out uh, a couple of days ago with this statement talking about uh, John uh, exclusive economy, sort of inequality uh, in culture, really uh, critiquing capitalism. And he got some blowback on that, people calling him a Marxist. I believe that was Rush Limbaugh. Here is what he had to say. Uh, Pro Pope Francis, he gave an interview to La Stampa. I think that's the pronunciation there. Uh, the Marxist ideology is wrong, Pope Francis said, but I have met many Marxists in my life who are good people, so I don't feel offended. I wonder, John, if you could talk about uh, sort of criticism this pope has received from the right, not necessarily folks like Palin or Rush Limbaugh, but within the church. Is there any sort of sector in the church that has what might be called buyer's remorse? Well, uh, I'll come to that in a minute. Let me just say as a journalist how refreshing it is to have a pope who is actually accessible. So when something like this blows up, that right. is, you know, Rush Limbaugh blasts him for being a capitalist, you can actually go to him and get a response. Or another point in that La Stampa interview, there's been a lot of speculation about whether Pope Francis might or might not name women cardinals. He was actually willing to go on the record and say, I have no idea where that idea came from, but I'm not going to do it. Uh, and so it's just helpful to, to have a pope who was willing to, to sort of short circuit some of that speculation. Uh, but as, the, as far as the buyer's remorse thing, I mean, look, a lot of people want to want to analyze the reaction in, to Pope Francis in terms of left v. right, that is, a left that is largely happy and a right that isn't. I, you know, I'm not sure that's the best way to go about it because, okay. you know, I, I think there, there are a lot of conservatives who, who think that the missionary potential of this pope is awesome, and I think there are some liberals who are worried he's not going to go nearly far enough. But I, I do think what you have is certain constituencies in the church who are just a little worried that they're being left out of the party. I mean, you know, uh, there would be some pro-life Catholics, for example, who when they hear this pope say, we don't have to talk so much about the culture wars, they worry that that amounts to surrender. There would be some liturgical traditionalists, people who are really invested in the kind of the smells and bells of Catholic worship, <laughs> who don't think this pope is as attached to that as he ought to be. Uh, you know, there would be some doctrinal purists, frankly, who think his shoot from the hip style courts confusion and on and on. But the one thing I can tell you, having watched Jorge Mario Bergoglio in action, uh, this is an extraordinarily politically savvy man. It's not that he doesn't know that reaction is out there. He's incredibly well aware of it. I think he's going to do what he can to reach out to those constituencies, but at the same time, I think he sees some of that resistance as the price that has to be paid to move the church forward as he sees it. 
And can, Simone, I, can yep. I just piggyback Sister on that, Simone. John? The, the, in this exhortation that he issued uh, two weeks ago, there's this lovely paragraph that says, and if I upset some people, it's not my intention to do it. What I want to do is to set you free from the chains that bind you to be your more noble selves, to respond to the needs around you. It's an exquisite paragraph. So he acknowledges the limitation, the criticism, but then does it from a spiritual stance of yeah. wanting to set people free. Set Isn't people that free. fabulous? Yeah, who can, who can argue with that? Uh, John, I want you to talk about, in one of your articles, I think this came out in October, uh, you talked about this uh, Pope's approach as essentially being two parts. One being the PR part, which we've seen uh, since March, since he uh, rose to the papacy, uh, and, and more substance coming later. And he's had meetings with the Council of Cardinals. Uh, what do you think we're going to see in terms of stu uh, substance? Well, I mean, you're right. I mean, Francis has laid out repeatedly this kind of vision of reform as a two-step process. What he said is you have to get the attitudes right first, and then the structures will follow. So right. he's laid out a, a kind of set of attitudes for what the church ought to be. Uh, now he's working on translating that into structures, and we've already seen some significant steps. I mean, he's issued a, a new law, for example, uh, regarding Vatican finances, which is in, basically intended to continue the cleanup operation to bring the Vatican in line with 21st century standards of transparency and accountability. And he just got a clean bill of health, basically, from the Council of Europe's anti-money laundering agency, which is one indication that those reforms are taking hold. Uh, he's working on changing personnel uh, in the Vatican. In fact, just today, he shuffled the lineup of the Vatican's all-important congregation for bishops, the okay. office that, that has control of naming future bishops basically moving it in a more moderate and less hardline direction. Uh, and I, I think we're going to see more of that. I think we're going to see a shakeup uh, in terms of the composition of the Vatican, a kind of downsizing. Uh, he's talked about the need to promote uh, a healthy decentralization in the church, so taking some power away from Rome and, and spreading it around to the local churches. Uh, so we're going to see that continue. I think ultimate, ultimately, Neo, what it's all rooted in is that Francis's core spiritual value is mercy. I mean, I frankly think the best way to capture his spirit is that this is the Pope of mercy. And what he wants is when people look at the Catholic Church, he wants them to perceive a community that doesn't just pay lip service to mercy, but actually practices it in its internal life. And I think all of the details of the kind of structural reform he's, he's engaged in right now right. ultimately are intended to promote that idea. And Sister Simone, I'm going to give you the last word here <laughs> since you're a sister. Um, what are you, I mean, what's your sense of sort of what makes a good pope and how will we know if this pope is successful? Well, I, I think a good pope responds to the times and what's needed, and it varies from year to year, age to age. But right now, I think what's evident is this world is hungry for a spiritual leader who understands mercy, as John says, and who can communicate that to a community of people all around the globe where no one is excluded, all are welcome at the table. It is a healing message for now, and that will be the measure of his success. Sister Simone Campbell of Network, your executive director of that organization, Nuns on the Bus as part of it. And John Allen, John, I want to ask you one quick question as well. The rumor is that this Pope sneaks out at night and he <laughs> ministers to the homeless. Is that true? <laughs> Do we know? No, that's one of the urban myths that have grown up about Pope Francis. And not only has he denied it personally, but so has everyone who would have knowledge of his nocturnal movements. <laughs> but me, I, I, think, I think the interesting thing about it uh, is that this story got legs precisely because it's plausible. Right, In other words, would exactly. do that. Take, the, yeah, take the robot. And they would out. say he's enough of a maverick and he loves the poor enough, but it's the kind of thing he would do. Right. Uh, that to me is the most revealing element of it all. John Allen, National Catholic Reporter, thank you guys so much. That's it for us today. Thanks again to our guests for joining us now for our Twitter question of the day. How do you define success for a pope? What should his top responsibility, uh, our responsibilities actually be? Tweet us your answers to at background and use that hashtag post back and we'll see you right back here tomorrow.